How are you guys? All right, for you guys that uh, don't know me already, my name is Darren Schneider. I am the director for Advanced Recording, and we up, we love the studio stuff. Um, man, you guys are in for a total treat. This is um, a very exciting thing for me, as well as you guys. Um, the guy who's going to come out is not only, and, and, and at face value, it's amazing. You know, he's a two-time Engineer of the Year Grammy winner. Not just regular Grammys. Like, you know, there's Grammys in every category, two-time Engineer of the Year. I mean, all of us would kill to have a one-time Engineer of the Year Grammy, and he's got two of them. Plus Album of the Year, a few other things, numerous, numerous gold platinum records, um, and just a really cool guy to hang out with. He loves gear, he loves audio, so let's bring him out. Let's bring out Tom Lord Algae. <laughs> What's up, Cole Sam? Good to be here. Ah. I like that all-around good guy. He's an all-around good guy. <laughs> and we've known each other a minute. Yeah. <laughs> well, and here's the deal. All the virtual people out there, you guys can be Googling, and I would encourage you to go on your computer and just type in Tom Lord Algae, all music, and you can start at 1980, and you're probably going to finish scrolling by the time we get about halfway through here. So there is record after record, and iconic record. That's kind of the other thing that's very different about Tom, his brother Chris. Um, they're coming from records that we're still covenanting as the best records ever made. That era of rock records is where Tom came up. He cut his teeth there. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we're going to start is at the beginning. Because a lot of people don't know the whole lineage of your family. Yeah. yeah well, it started at the beginning. It's, it, it really started with, with my mom, Vivian, and my father, Frank. Um, my father, Frank, was in the jukebox business. Grew up with jukeboxes and pinball machines in the house. I used to take them apart. My old man was pissed because I could never get them back together. And then my mom, who's a jazz artist, she's a jazz singer, jazz piano player, as well as jazz educator. So we always were around music. I'm the youngest of six, of six children, and uh, my mom's favorite. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it kind of all started out with, with music in the house. So as a, as a kid, you know, in, in my, uh, you know, eight, nine years old, I always remember going to sleep and hearing my mom rehearsing with her jazz trio in the, in, the, in the living room of the house. So there's always music around the house, and on Saturdays, Dad would take us to the shop, and we get to open up the file and pull out the 45 records, you know, seven-inch vinyl records that he used to put in the jukeboxes, and we'd be able to take whatever we wanted. You were hearing them before they actually hit the, the, the streets then. Yeah, so back then, my father's route was New York City, so this is, you know... When he started, it was well before radio, so the way music got, people got hit records were getting records into his jukeboxes. So it kind of started like that. But, you know, being the youngest son or the youngest child, um, obviously it's myself, my brother Jeff, and my brother Chris are three closest in age. So we always hung out quite a bit, and, and obviously me being the youngest, they hated it, you know, because I'd be like stealing their records and shit like that. So to move on into the story, it literally led to my brother Chris. Have any, any of you guys heard of my brother Chris? <laughs> okay. I'm a much better mixer. Because <laughs> I learned from the best. My brother Chris. So Chris taught me, but I'm much better. Um, but yeah, so Chris would steal my mom's... My mom had like a little, little uh, TIAC four-track you know, quarter inch four track recorder and a little four track mixer. And when mom would go, mom did gigs every weekend. So she would leave the house at seven at night and wouldn't be home till three in the morning. So of course, then Chris kind of like set up a little studio in the basement. Yeah, he told me all, he was, he's like, this was the defining thing was when she went. That's right. You guys would play. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, we would play and sometimes we had parties and, <laughs> You know, because mo we knew that mom was coming home from a smoky bar, so she wouldn't notice that the house was filled with smoke, <laughs> you know, because we had just, like, smoked, like, you know, whatever. I, I, you guys can paint your own picture. But it kind of started like that, and, and, and to be honest, I mean, 
it was really that sound craftsman dual 10 band equal, you know, graphic equalizer um, that, that really got me going. And, and again, I always used to try and pinch Chris's and he, he used to beat the shit out of me, you know, for grabbing it and because I wanted to learn about it, you know. And finally, when I was probably 12 or 13, I saved up enough money to buy my own and I still have the damn thing. What was it like for you? Like, I know Chris was in, and he moved into some of the studios before working age. Yes. So Chris, through my mom's network of friends, um, one of my mother's friends had, um, had a, an inn at the studio called H&L Recording Studios. It was in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. It later became Sugar Hill Gang Studio, where, all the, where they made all, like, Rapper's Delight and all those Sugar Hill records. But... Uh, a friend of my mom had an in with it in the place, and they needed an intern. So my mom pitched Chris. They accepted him. He went there and he cleaned toilets and made coffee and shadowed, you know, and did did the dirty work. Um, I'm always very blessed and thankful to my brother Chris because I never had to do that. Chris did, <laughs> and then eventually Chris worked his way up to become an assistant, and he worked with an engineer named Steve Jerome, who was Steve Jerome, who was his mentor. And Chris worked there when it switched over to Sugar Hill, worked on some of those records that, that you guys know about Sugar Hill. And if, if I'm correct, and, and, and I'm sure that somebody might chime in, Chris was fired because they caught him using the studio for free late, in, late at night. He would go in there with his band and cut tracks late at night, and he, he got pinched doing that. Um, during this period of time, around the time when I was 16 years old, um, I was well into music. I knew how the equipment operated. I would go out and do gigs when Chris's band was, 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 was playing. I would do lights. And at one of those gigs, somebody offered me, hey, you know, we're, we're working and we're working in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We work five nights a week and we need somebody to do lights and haul gear. Would you be interested? I'm like, of course I'd be interested. I went home. I was 16 years old. I went home. I told my mom and my mother and my mother says, I'll sign you out of school as long as you have a job. And I'm like, I have a job. So I, I, I did that. I went and I went, did lighting. So I did, it was on a small scale, not a huge scale, probably a stage around this size and around this many lights. You know, it was enough that we, we, we'd be able to carry it. So I did that for a couple of years and I was working with a, a particular band and, and uh, one night the front of house engineer got ill and the band said to me, okay, you're doing front of house tonight. And I go, can I do lights too? And they go, no. <laughs> um, so I just did front of house. And then, because I knew how to all the equipment operated, I was the one that was setting the PA up every night. I was actually the one EQing it for the front of house engineer. I guess I did a good job. Because from then on, I was hired as the front of house engineer. Um, and during that period of time, I'm almost at the end no, of no, it. You're good. And during that period of time, now we're getting into the, the early to mid 80s. Chris had moved over to a studio called Unique Recording in Manhattan. And he was beginning to focus his energies on becoming a mixing engineer. And he kept calling me up. He would call me up and says, this would be a really good job for you. You would do really well here in the studio. And by that point, I had owned my own PA system. I was renting it out to bands. I was going out doing gigs. And I believe it was New Year's Eve, and it was probably 19, 1983. Going into 83 or going into 84, I had a dispute with the band because the band got paid four times what they normally get paid on New Year's Eve, and they weren't willing to share the profit. So I just packed up my PA, and I never looked back. And literally, two, like two days later, I started a Unique Recording, and I was assisting my brother Chris. And every assistant in that recording studio hated me because I literally cut to the front of the line. And... and I was hired as an engineer because they took the, 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 the owner of the studio, Bobby Nathan, took the chance. He's like, I think this guy is going to do really well. And Chris trained me really well. He basically, he would shadow me. Like, I would shadow him the whole time. But then one time we were doing vocals. We were doing, working with James Brown. And I think we were doing, like, Living in America. Yeah. And James is in there singing the song. The tape machine's in record. And Chris just gets up and walks out of the room. Okay, here we go. And I just sit at the console, you know, and James says, stop, you know, okay, what do you need? Punch me back in at the second chorus, no problem. You know what I mean? And I was scared shitless. I had, I had, I had like, 
I had no reason to be there. So we got through the session. I go, bro, what the, f you know, yeah. why, why'd you leave? He's like, I didn't see what you're made of. You know, he goes, you did good, you know. And then from then, from then on, what we, we, what we would do is I would cut the tracks that Chris would end up mixing, which led to a project by an artist named Steve Winwood that I did in, in 1985 that Chris was hired to mix. Chris didn't, Chris did, it was a recording project and then a mixing project. So Chris didn't want to spend the time recording it. So he's like, here's the deal. He goes, you record it and I'll mix it. And I was like, great, no problem. So I worked on that album. We spent eight months recording that album. And when it came time to mix, the artist was like, you know, we really like what you're doing. Um, we'd like you to mix it. And, and I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, Chris is going to be pissed. <laughs> He's really going to be pissed. And I told Chris... And Chris is not a person that, that's just going to take He's it, my right? older yeah, brother. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm like... So I go and talk to him about it, and he's like... He goes, Tom, it doesn't matter which Lord Algae mixes it, as long as it's a Lord Algae. And I was like, thanks, bro. I really appreciate that. And I guarantee you, he's still eating those words because I won a Best Engineered Recording Grammy for that record. Thanks to what my brother did. Yeah, exactly. I just want to finish. With the, I'm gonna, no, no, go, go. There, there, and it all comes first full circle. If, first of all, hey, hey Chris, what's up, bro? <laughs> uh, there we go. We always burp with each other. What's up, bro? It comes first cir full circle. Two years later, I, I produced, recorded, and mixed another Steve Winwood album. I won another Best Engineered Recording Grammy. My poor brother Chris has never won that Grammy. Please join the Academy. Okay? Vote for him. And under Best Engineered Recording, right, get him in so we can get him that award that he deserves. But to pay the favor, so I was able to pay the favor back unknowingly some 20 years later. So fast forward, I'm mixing at South Beach Studios. I'm living in South Florida. I get hired by a band two months in advance because that's how far in advance I was booked. I was just slammed. Two weeks before the, the project, you know, they were supposed to come down and mix the album with me. I get a call from the producer. The producer's like, would you consider coming to Los Angeles to mix this album? And I'm like, well, do you want my best mixes? And they're like, well, of course we want your best mixes. And I says, I'm going to do my best mixes here at South Beach Studios. And they go, well, the band can't come down. The band can't come to South Florida. It has to be mixed in Los Angeles. And I go, I know a guy. <laughs> I just happen to know a guy in Los Angeles. So I recommended my brother Chris for the job. And he mixed it. And he freaking killed it. And the album, it was Green Day, American Idiot. Yeah. He won his first Grammy on that album. So I felt that even though it wasn't the best engineered recording Grammy, it was his first Grammy. So at one point in the mid to late 90s, the Academy changed the rules that included engineers and producers and mastering engineers to receive certain categories to receive a Grammy. So that's how I got my third one. Yeah. For the mix that it, for mixing I did on the Santana Supernatural, yep. so boy, that was a long story. It, no, but it, it's an important story, and, and I, I've been kind of making mental notes of, of where to hit, and and so I'd just like to go back to that moment where you jump on the console. Was that the bug? Was that the moment when you actually had the control of the drums, the bass, the guitars? Because mixers are very meticulous about control meticulous about you don't different, say. yeah, different things. So <laughs> that's my wife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so the question is, is, was it instant? Was it built through? Was it, um, even some, you know, brother rivalry that you're like, you know what? I, I can do that too. Again, I have to go back to, yeah, I got to think about it for a second. <laughs> well, what, as where, where, as was the, where was the that, light bulb? Where was no, the yeah. light bulb? When you said what you just said, was my brother saying, "If even if you can't do it, just figure it out." In other words, don't ever let your client know. So I mean, I remember when recording back in the high life, they were asking me to do stuff. So the album back in the high life, the big hit on that was a song called "Higher Love," well before all your times. It just happened to be the first album 
I ever recorded studio, first studio album that I ever, ever recorded live drums. Like, I'd never recorded live drums before. And by the way, you should really, I mean, just as a, a study project, just go put the record on and listen to the whole record, because it also was a time where you were making well, the actually, whole record. The, 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 just go to the first song, yeah. Higher Love, okay? So one of the things they asked me to do was to create an intro for Higher Love. So one of the things that I learned, so we were recording on analog tape. Chris always told me, always in record, if there's a musician playing, you should always be recording it, okay? Because you can always erase it. And back then, we used to stri every song was six minutes long, even no matter what it ended up being final. We striped six minutes of multi-track tape, right? And usually after the fifth chorus, you know, at the end, the band would just start screwing around and you just hear like all this noodling, you know? But one of the things they're like, come up with this intro for the song. And literally the drummer, at the end of the song, started playing this really weird stick timbali thing. And I was just like, how about something like this? And I just flew the shit to the front of the song, and pretty much the rest of it is history. But Chris always said to me, he says, even if you don't know what you're doing, you'll figure it out along the way. And you'll make mistakes, and shit will happen, but you'll learn from it. Yeah, so for, for these guys coming up in that different era of a lot more isolation, not having that, you know, kind of mentorship. Like, that was obviously a massive influence, obviously, with your brother. But even, you know, the studios in New York, the time in New York was everybody was, you know, we talked about our mutual friend Jason. Well, everybody was helping everybody. Everybody was helping everybody, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's, I mean, one of the reasons that, that Chris and I and a lot of uh, engineers of our generation we like to come out and talk and share our experiences because, yes, there, there, there's none of that anymore. It's not like you guys walk into a studio. I mean, I remember doing an album. I did an album for this band called Living in a Box, and we were at Olympic Studios in London. Love and that. in the next room was Queen. The freaking Queen in the next room. The, I was working. The producer was Dan Hartman. Dan goes over to Brian May. He said, hey, Brian, would you play a guitar solo on this song? And Brian's like, sure thing. A fucking Brian May. Uh, fucking comes in with a guitar made by his father playing with these coins. You know, and like, I forgot what coin, yeah. but these... It's some, a British, British coin. Some, and I'm like, I'm just going, oh, this is just too fucked up. Yeah. You know, and then I'm over there on another project, and Michael Brower is in the other room mixing stones. They're rolling fucking stones. <laughs> and I'm like, this is so cool. And these places, what they would do is they would, you would have dinner breaks, so they actually had a, a kitchen. So like the townhouse and Olympic were owned by the same yeah. company. So at like, what do you want? The six or the seven o'clock dinner? So depending on which one you booked, you could be, be eating dinner with, I mean, one time I was eating dinner with a, a band called XTC and Hugh Padgham. Yeah, he was. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and you're just kind of like, hey man, how you doing? You're, you're tr I'm trying to play it as cool as possible. But yeah, so w w Chris and I, you know, when I, I saw Chris getting involved in sharing the knowledge, I'm like, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, because I don't want, I mean, I have, a, I have a little bit of knowledge in this. So what's your advice? I mean, and the other thing is just even fast forwarding to where you're at now. Um, well, I guess let's, let's, let's jump back. So, so you're in New York. How do you get to Miami? What was, the, what was the big transition? Because this is a big move. Yeah, so actually, um, I started my career in New York City. Um, and I was doing a lot of trips to Los Angeles because Los Angeles really, so when I started New York City really was the recording hub. And then between, from the mid eighties to the early nineties, it shifted over to Los Angeles. So in the early nineties, I found myself doing a lot of traveling to Los Angeles. So I said, screw it. Let me move to Los Angeles and be where the work is. So I bought a house in Los Angeles and literally the first gig I got booked was in New York. Of course it was. It was Dave Matthews under the table and dreaming. I'm like, dude, I just moved to Los Angeles, and now you want me to mix at the power station in New York. So, but I moved to Los Angeles. I never really felt very comfortable living out there. So in 1995, Island Records contacted me to mix a band called Tripping Daisy. And they said, if we mixed in Miami Beach at Island Records Studios, which was owned by, South Beach Studios was owned by Island Records at the time, the band would get a, you know, they would get a break on it. So I'm like, sure. I came down to the studio, 
I fell in love with the studio. I fell in love with South Beach. You know, in the 90s, it was awesome. And uh, I was there for South Beach Studios for 20 years. You know, and when South Beach Studio closed, I bought all the gear and I put it in my house. Yeah, so, so moving to your house, like, were you still taking interns? Were you, did you have assistants still? Were, I mean, what was the process for that? So during the time, for my whole career, I've always had an assistant. Um, as I got better and better, and as I saw the technology shifting, um, well, I'm just going to tell the damn story. I needed to get myself more knowledgeable in the, in the gear that I was going to be using in the future. So I never knew if I was always going to have a large format mixing console, you know, like I'm mixing on an SSL 4000 series. So I, I, I focused my energies and become very proficient in operating Pro Tools. And if the case needed, if the case happened that, that I needed to mix in the box, that I would be able to do it on my own. How, my, how, the, the, how I ended up working on my own is my assistant who was studio, he was the studio assistant, okay, worked with me for years, but he was hired by the studio, paid for by the studio. He had a, dis a dispute with the studio and didn't show up for work one day, and it was the day one of a me mixing an album, and the band was there, and he effed me really good, yeah. okay? But it was, just, it was just like this. I, it brought me back to the day when Chris left me in the room with James Brown recording a vocal. I'm like, okay, here we go, and I figured it out. You know what I mean? And from then on, I just swore to myself that I would never be beholden to an assistant to get my work done. But but are you using like when whatever? I mean, we just you know not just going to. I mean, I still that most that most you know thing. But like, are you're willing to take the direction from those close people too? You still have a network of people that are oh, in the new tech that oh, are yeah, always bringing it to the table. Oh no, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean. Just talking about an assistant, I mean, yes, it, it would be, to me, it's a wonderful luxury. But for, I was more focused on how can I operate this all on my own, you know what I mean? Because if, you, if I can, how can I just control my own destiny, period? Right, and, and so streamlining, obviously, the hybrid world, which we'll get into the gear thing towards more towards the end, but, you know, the evolution from where we came from, which was analog to Dash, to Pro Tools, to where you guys are at now with these unlimited tracks, even back in the high life, you guys are making track choices, you're making creative decisions that you're committing yes. to tape, which I know you're a huge fan of even today. I am. I mean, if it's, I mean, if, get it to sound good. I mean, the, the, you all know the expression, shit in, shit out. You know what I mean? So like, it should sound good every, every time you listen to it. So basically, if it doesn't sound good, move the mic. Add a little EQ, add some compression. So with that in mind, how important, because you came up in, uh, and not everybody does, come up in a musical family and all this other stuff. How, how do you feel and what do you think the importance is, is even if you're not a great player, of understanding you know, guitar amps, guitar heads, what's the difference, different pedals, like to create that, to be involved in that creative process, do you think that's still as much a thing in what you're seeing today as it was even for us? No, so here, here's my opinion on that. I'm not a musician. I could give two shits if it's a Marshall, a Fender, you know, or what, whatever it is. Th that to me is the artist's choice. So in other words, let me hear your sound. What I like to do is, if, with the guitar player, for using that as an example, let me go out, let me hear his sound, let me hear it through his rig, so I know what it sounds like coming out of his rig, so I can get that to come out of the speakers in the control room, as far as it's his choice. Then I would make the decision, okay, is this sound now working with what we're putting together? But as far as like them m making the sounds, like it's, it's up to them for what sound they want, you know what I mean? And obviously in, in, in modern recording now, it's like, you know, you're putting a DI track down, that's, that's all fine and dandy. It's just gonna complicate things later. How about we just get a great sound out of your amp and live with that, you know are, what I mean? Are you getting that on, like, is that what you're getting from, you know, whoever it is, you know, whoever's making the record now, when they're sending you tracks, are they sending you actual record tracks? Or are they saying, hey, put on whatever, you know, plug-in amp you want? I specify, you know, give me, give me, commit, Commit the, the, what you have from your last rough mix that everybody loves, okay? Because if you send me DI, I mean, basically, 
if that sound is an, an inherent part of the, or if, if the sound is the inherent, that's the way I'm trying to say it. Like, basically, if it's the hook sound, sure. like, I want it to sound like how you have it. You know, I mean, make the commitment to it. I mean, so one thing that you, you get carried, people get, get, get hung up on is being able to change stuff during the process. So remember, so I don't know how many of you musicians, I don't know how many of you engineers, but for the engineers, remember, like, musicians, what they do, their job is playing, okay? So, like, I don't know, I don't know many musicians that would be pissed off if, like, if at least they committed with a sound, and then as the production went on, they were like, hey, you know what, that sound's not working. Let me just play it again. Like, what's the big deal? It's like, literally. I guess that's what I was kind of getting at was... Yeah, it's the, the guys the, that are like... And the, the one thing that always gets, gets me going is like, oh, yeah, that first chorus is fine. Just fly that into all the choruses. How about your fucking guitar player? <laughs> just play the choruses. You know what I mean? And then double it. Well, yeah, or quarter or whatever, yeah. You know. <laughs> But yeah, one's good, four are better, right? You know, but it, again, it's in the world of of open, it's just you know where literally the the choices are endless. You could just drive yourself crazy. So that's another question: Do you limit yourself in the amount of tech that you're taking in to not cloud your judgment? No, hell no. I'm doing what's best for the song. So in other words, you'd be surprised at some of the stuff that I do. I mean, how much are you, that I, how much are you playing with new plugins or, or all this? I mean, are that's, you trying to incorporate that's it what keeps every me, day? That's yeah, okay, the, cool. That's what kind of like, that's what gets, so inspiration comes in so many different formats. It can come with, it can come with visual images. It can come in, 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 in the source of audio images, you know, listening to music. Um, it can come with opening a new plugin and going, whoa. What is that? And then turning knobs. One thing I never do is read manuals. I've never read a, read a manual for any piece of equipment. You know, and basically, and I'm sure solid state logic has always been pissed off about that because I broke many a console. You know, well, what do you mean it's not supposed to do that? It sounds cool when you do that. So basically, it just, what I, I well, just and, turn the knob so it and sounds that is good. A, that's, a, that's a good transition to one of your trademarks, which is pushing, pushing that line amp of the SSL. That, that is part of yours and your brother's both signature kind of impact is not making it wrong, but abusing it to the point where you're right on the edge of that. Again, if it's, it's all about how is, it impact, how is it hitting you, you know, like when I, when I sit down and mix... It's got to get me off. Like, if, it, if I'm not getting off on the mix, how can I expect my clients to get off on the mix? How can I expect them to approve it? You know, so I never half-ass it. And I, and I experiment all the time. That's great. And that's, I think that is one of the things that we always encourage everybody to do is, you know, try new plugins, listen to. And, and we now have this universe of YouTube. Your videos are up. Your brother's videos are up. And, you know, there's so much information about what to do. Uh, and then that's kind of like where a place like this really comes into play because they can come into the studio and apply that. They can really hear that difference between what's happening. Um, you're mostly getting albums from big pro producers, stuff like that, you know, still recorded, you know, with, you know, whoever Kenny's doing drums or whatever it is, you know. I, look, I get, I get everything, you know. So I get pro record, what we would call pro recordings. I can, I can tell you that, I get recordings from people that are making records in their houses. So let's that, talk. That sometimes sound better than pro recordings. Right, and that's what so quote let, unquote. Let's pro let's go down that rabbit hole as a mixer, as a pro mixer. If if you know, we, what is your advice to them sending a song to a pro mixer? Like, what are your like? Just say top three things of things that could make all of our lives better and make your song better. Yes. Yeah, so one. Whatever files you send to me, as soon as I as soon as I open them up, it should at least resemble the song. Okay, so if, as an example, if you're recording the guitar part with the DI and the plug-in is making the sound, commit that. Okay, so remember you're going to be sending me a copy. So you, what you would do with your session, you know, whatever your last rough mix session that you that you that you love, just save a copy of it and then commit that stuff. Now, don't commit the vocal effects. Like, in other words, you would not send a vocal channel with stereo effects on it. But you would commit the tuning, 
okay? Because my tuning and your tuning are gonna work differently. So in other words, even though we have the same plugin, they're gonna react differently. If, if you've ever taken a channel and auto-tuned it and then duplicated it, the untuned channel, and auto-tuned it again and played the two of them together and put one of them out of phase, you'll notice they don't cancel out because it's changing. It constantly, yeah, it doesn't do it the same every time. So basically, you know, make the commitments. Yeah, and that, that was written into the software. And don't clean the TomTom -tom tracks. Jesus, for God's sake, you're not doing anybody any favors. Go up on YouTube, I show you exactly what to do with the TomTom -tom tracks. You can clean them and still remain and still have the sustain of the TomTom -tom without the cymbal hit. Yeah, you, you know, your brother has his samples, you have your uh, kick, snare, trigger, all that jazz that goes on. Correct. And, you know, I think that the idea of relying solely on that is something that has become, and, and especially in the last decade, has become so prevalent that, you know, you get a click and they're expecting you to put your, your Tom Lord, you know, on this or your brother's, here's the CLA kick drum, I, and that's not what you guys do. So no. maybe, let's just give, well, not too long, but let's go, let's okay, elaborate so on that. so with Chris, I can't speak for Chris, but I know, I mean, I know Chris, you know, first Chris is awesome with drums. For me, I try to manipulate the drum set that I'm given to get it to sound the best, and then I use samples to embellish that sound and make it better, okay? Um, Chris might treat it slightly different way. That's how I do it. But there are certain songs that they actually want it to sound like samples. Um, a project that, that came across my table recently, I mean, when I opened up the session, it was like 50 tracks of drums. You know, and like 25 of them were bass drum samples and snare drum samples. And I'm like, at what point did you feel that it was so okay to stop adding samples? You know, I'm like, let's not make it an even hundred. You know, you know I mean, and it's the more samples you add, it just, it just gets to be a bigger, you know, but again, that's, that's just my pet peeve. But again, it's, it's just get, get, start with a good sound. Just get a good sound. And then... File naming. Which is easy to say. Yeah, just, well, oh, just get yeah. a good sound. Yeah, just go. Well, no, so by good mic. sound, well, let yeah. me clarify good sound. Here's what I used to do I sit down and I start with a point of reference. And every day when I walked into the studio, I played this one song, okay? And it was Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard. And even though I wasn't mixing anything near to, to, to that, the top end and the bottom end at that particular moment in time oh, I think everybody was changed what I was using as the point of reference, okay? So I'd walk in, I'd turn the speakers on, and I'd, okay, now I know what, my, what sounds good, okay? Now I can work. So I'd listen to it every day for years and years and years until that was burned, that EQ curve was burned into my head. So if you have that as a point of reference, then you will understand what good sound is. So it, it doesn't have to be pour some sugar on me. You pick what you feel sounds great. You know what I mean? What you think sounds great. And you, when you start your day, you go and you listen to that. Okay, I'm ready to work. Let's go. Because then you have that EQ curve burned in your head. And then you know, oh, shit, these particular monitors, you know, they're a little heavy in the 300 range. You know what I mean? So you'll know to compensate. Yeah, and, the, and with the new monitors, I mean, they're, they're like we were talking a little bit earlier, I mean, there, there's so many of the new monitors that have processing systems and other things, and whatever it is they listen to, it doesn't matter if you process it, because that's the same thing with the processor. You can process the same room three times in a row and get three different curves. But, um, you know, when you find that one that works, that referencing of materials is something that, you know, we have to harp on these guys all the time about that because they're, they're like, you know, doing a country band and, and I'm like, well, what did you use as a reference? And they're using a metal band to reference a country song. Well, so again, I reference it when I talk about referencing, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of overall equalization curve. You know what I mean? You know, look, I have, it, I have to deal with it with producers, you know, that to go, you know, it sounds so different from the rough mix, you know, the EQ curve. And I go, yeah, because your rough mix stinks. You know, like, what was your reference point? So, in other words, if, if your rough mix is a reference point, I mean, I mean, shit, I can do all day long. You know what I mean? It's polishing it that takes all day. It's getting it to sound and getting, getting that energy to really come out. Are you working off of... Are they sending you a Pro Tools session that already is done, or you, or you prefer WAV files, so you're starting I from prefer, scratch with a rough? 
No, I prefer to be in a Pro Tools format. What I ask for is, I, I, if it's so, I ask for a Pro Tools session of their last rough mix, all plugins in. Just leave all any plugin that was whatever made up that session, just send it to me. That's that's how come I have like five thousand plugins because I have to have every plugin. I yeah, literally as soon as have you open to have it, you don't every have it, yeah. plugin, yeah. and that's how. See, that's where me as a as a mixer, I get to constantly evolve because I'm like, what is this plugin? I, I came across somebody who was using a, a plugin called Gull Gullfoss or Gulf. Gulfoss, G-U-L-F-O-S-S. And it's literally just like, all I know is like, you, you, you yeah, turn one, one button and, it, and one, it gets rid of all the harshness. Yeah, yeah, one knob, yeah. You, you know, but I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, but like little stuff like that, like when you see how these guys are using plugins that are in a totally different way than I'm using it. So basically, send me the session of your last rough mix with a stereo rough mix included, printed from your rig. Okay, because I have to confirm that it's playing back properly. And then, then I get to decide what I feel is working. You know what I mean? And normally what I do, again, I create, I create storage sessions. So I start with the drums. And normally on the drums, I just take off all their plugins and do it my way. But I'll store it in another folder. You know what I mean? Here's what, what, what their drums were. And then I'll go to the bass. You know what I mean? I had one guy come in with like eight channels of, you know, eight different microphones on the bass guitar. And it was just like, it went from shit to shittier to really freaking shitty. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, you know, I just used the DI and I, reamped it. I was going to say, you just take one and just reamp it. You know, but, <laughs> but what I do is I always save, because again, you can just make copies. I store them on storage drives, right? And again, when the guy goes, you know, can you just, you know, add a little bit of this, I can at least op open up to where the starting point was and get back to it. You know, and especially with guitars, I'll get sessions that are like 100 channels of guitars. You know what I mean? So I'll kind of pick what I feel are the best bits, you know, and however their plugins work, you know what I mean? And I'll literally commit them. And then I'll take the originals and store them to another place. And it happens on many occasions when I have to go back and just rebalance one part. Because as you're working on the mix, I'm like, Oh shit! I probably shouldn't have put those two parts together. Yeah, and and I I think you know, f file management, saving it's, copies, it's, all of that is 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 just <coughs> normal dialogue today. Well, yeah, but well, you think so? I I mean I I'm opening them up on my computer and I'm like, how the hell are you getting your this session to play on your computer? I mean I have like the latest Mac Pro with like 192 gig of RAM. You know what I mean? And my system is, is clogging. You know what I mean? How did you get this to play? On a you know, laptop. For, so if you're working on laptops, again, figure it out. Like, you know, take all the stuff that's using up all of your, your memory it, yeah. while it's playing, right? Commit it, and then just save the originals to a folder on another hard drive. This is how they used, this is how the Beatles did it. This is how they were, they started with a four track. And they recorded on three and of them. 500 tapes later, or, yep. Right, and they just kept moving down the line. And if they, had a, if they had to go back and rebalance something, it was a process, but it was doable. Now, it's not even a, like, it's not even a process. It's like, oh, shit, yeah, I can rebalance those guitars. Yeah, Let me open up the original. Click, yeah. Boom, 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 import, zit, done. <laughs> okay, so we have so much to cover, it's ridiculous, but... I do want to get into a little bit of the creative, the art of mixing. So what we're going to do real quick, we're not going to play the whole song, but uh, we're going to have them play a little bit of a uh, Blink-182 song. And, and again, you guys do hear Blink-182? Yeah. yeah. Every time I do a, 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 a seminar, yeah, when, yeah. I first, when I first started doing the seminars, I remember everybody just, do you have the Blink-182 multi-tracks? I'm like, yeah, I didn't bring them. And it literally, after I did the second seminar, I'm like, oh, shit. I went home and I remixed some of the Blink songs. Okay, I yeah, I got the Blink stuff. And then I was just like, here you guys go. Here's the multi-track. Have fun. You yeah, know? but also, I mean, and, and it's not just Blink. It's uh, Yellow Card. It's, you know, Sum 41. It's like, so this, this whole chunk, um, you know, yourself, Neil Avron. There's a bunch of great, you know, people that, this, this oh, new yeah, rock yeah, yeah. sound. You, you guys changed from where we were at early 90s. This, this kind of, this new rock, you know, in your face, um, you know, 
not pop punk, but but had that flavor of punk to it, you know. And and was that intentional, or did that just happen because what what was coming at no, you? No, there was. So you got Jerry Finn, the, our, our dearly departed friend Jerry Finn, who did Dookie, who produced Dookie and mixed Dookie. Excuse me. Also, uh, I believe Jerry Finn, I want to say, produced Enema of the State, you know. So, uh, yeah. So it it was just that's what was going on at the time. So yeah, I mean I remember. I, I mean look, I mixed Denim of the State that whole album. I think I mixed it in two days. You know what I mean? Like now, I I did a, a modern mix of Adam's song. It took me all day, but it's fucking the modern version is fucking ridiculous. You know what I mean? But it's just how how it changed back then. So generally, when I'm mixing an album back then, it was all analog. So the first mix took the longest. And then you just put the next song up, you change a couple of patch chords, you make a couple of adjustments, boom, done, next. Yeah, the first song always got that. But let's listen to this for a sec, because I, I do really want to dive in uh, just for, for a few minutes on, on the, the art and, and how every tracking engineer is not a mix engineer. Every, we don't like master, like, you know, whether it's Ted or somebody else. Like, the idea of you being everything works but sometimes it doesn't and this i think is a great example of of you know you specializing them doing their job and all those things line up together is what makes these you know insane records so, yeah Mixed that like 20 something years ago, or just a tad under 20 years ago. And, and, and again, I probably mixed that song in two hours, but I asked them to play that song because I just love that damn song. You know, and you see, like, so what, this what, is what it's about. Yeah, and what moment does like, that bring I you listen back to that to? and I go, fuck, that's just so damn good. Does it, yeah, and it brings you back to a Tom that was like, there was no boundary. Oh, man. I, you don't know how many times I sit in my studio and, I, and I'll put a song on that I mixed a long time ago and go, how do I get myself back in that head? How do I get, and you can't, you can't. But all you can do is do what I just did. I sat back here and when the song started, I'm like, oh, that doesn't, because I'm behind the monitors. You know, so when I got out in front of the monitors, then all of a sudden you saw my, my whole aura changed. Because now I'm like, fuck yeah, that's good. But yeah, I can never get back to that head. But what I do, because <laughs> really I'm like, oh my God, it's so dark and muddy. <laughs> I'm like, shit, did I pick the wrong song? <laughs> no, and then I, I went out there and I was just like, oh yeah, that's what it's supposed to sound like. But yeah, so I mean, my mixing style and, and how I mix, is, it's, it's a constant evolution, constantly evolves. So again, the mix I did of the modern mix I did of Adam's song, which again it's not released, it's my own version. I use it when I do mixing seminars, you know, when I'm in a studio in a console. Sure, absolutely. It's not that it's a night and day difference. It's just the EQ curve from when I mix that to the way we mix today has changed. So there's more bottom end. You use more bottom end today, more top end, and more compression. And people back then said, wow, you really compress a lot. Man, they should see what I'm doing now. If that meter could go around a couple of times, you know, like my, the, the compression meters, just they just never come back, even on the breaths. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, and that's, that's part of the energy is the stuff in between the vocal. And, Correct. And that is like a, a, a trick. And, and I think that's one of the things our friend Jason, you know, was like, look, the word 
the lyric is important, but that, that breath, that psychology of, you know, the quick breath, the energy, that, that's what we control as mixers. Yeah, so a lot of people with the, where they stumble with it is because they want to get that just overly compressed, really great sounding vocal, and they don't know how to deal with the guy now has asthma every time he takes a breath because it's like the vocal sounds great until he takes a breath and it's like, <laughs> okay, and it's real simple. <laughs> you, you, you just highlight the breath, you know, separate the regions and drop the clip gain down 20 dB. And then the breath sounds natural. Yeah, and then don't forget to crossfade. And don't forget to crossfade it. <laughs> oh, I'll come after you guys if you don't put crossfades in, especially on a bass. And remember, when you're putting automation moves on anything, drums and bass, anything that has bottom end, that it also creates a click. Just, just a 2 dB bump will also put a ticking, a digital ticking noise in. Do you, do you, like on that song, uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but do you, I know sometimes it happens in mastering, but a lot of times mixers like to take, and maybe it's a, a you know, 0.5 dB in the chorus. Bumping, I know your brother does this all the time, where he's bumping the chorus. Uh, that he's got little... to, because he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't say that, Chris. Hi, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to so, kill both of us. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do what I call trick the listener. You know, I mean, so generally what I just do is, you know, when the choruses come in, I just push everything up and, and then I just slowly over two bars, tuck it back in again, just to get that downbeat, that real impact. You know, um, when, I, when, I, when I do it on the master fader, it's only a last resort. But yeah, so you, it's I mean, literally is like, it, is it the whole, is it, are you like doing all no, groups usually, or are you just doing like drums, bass, just that no, little it's kick? It's usually maybe? drums, bass and whatever, I mean, drums, guitars, whatever the focal point should be, right. but usually it's just the drums. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, a 3DB drum on the, 3D, 3DB bump on the drums and then, and then just slowly bring it back down. It's a little nugget for you guys to try for sure. <laughs> okay. So we're going to run out of time. Um, but man, there, there's, there's so many ends of things that are going on. Um, Tom just got married, just so you guys know. It's his wife back there. And, and, <laughs> and uh, oddly I, enough, literally, in the, w when we arrived here, I, I had to go in back in the green room. <laughs> I just closed on the house I just purchased. I literally signed the documents backstage. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm moving to Austin, Texas. Andy is taking his SSL with him. I'm has, taking my two, two SSLs. Yeah, he has two now. Um, so so let's, in, let's I'm, I do want to totally get to questions, but, but real quickly, this SSL, the 4000 that you have, he's got a, a 4000G. I mixed on, the, the, the Blink-182 is mixed on that console. I've had, uh, I've been working on that, that exact console for 25 years. So, it, but I was unable to fit it. I sold my, uh, my residence in Miami Beach for 20, 22 years last year. Bought another house in Miami Beach. That house didn't have a room big enough for the 4000 series, so I bought an SSL Origin, which is, is actually awesome. So it's a brand, it was a brand new SSL. That worked out great for seven months, seven months. Doesn't that bother you a little bit that you can buy the awesome SSL at a tenth of your 4000? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I paid more for the Origin than I did for the 4K. Oh, you got such a deal. <laughs> I don't even want to talk but, about that deal. So. Then. So I bought an SSL Origin to, because it fit in, into the new house, and, and, it, and it's an absolutely magnificent console. Um, and now we have a house in Austin, Texas, where, I, where I can, I'm going to build studios for both so I can fit both of them in. All right, let's go to questions. There's a microphone over there so you guys can wrap around. Um, do we have online questions or anything that we can do right off, or we just, we'll go with these first over here and... and he is not shy, as you guys have seen, so hit him with whatever you got. You can start with your name. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dylan. Uh, I'm going to be a recording arts graduate on May 6th. And, congratulations. Uh, thanks, you graduated man. May 6th? Yes. Yes, sir. Dude, congratulations. 6'6". Six, six. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. I got your brother's uh, CLNA uh, NX head tractor as well. Nice. Pretty so crazy. do I. Yeah, that thing's crazy. <laughs> I had to fucking buy them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you That's fucking wild. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just curious, um, when you have a, uh, so like recently I had an artist send me their um, stems, but she didn't send it to me correctly. And so I tried to timestamp everything in Pro Tools, but everything wasn't lining up in the format of a song. 
And so I've had a really difficult time trying to get a hold of her as far as being able to figure out how to go forward with the project. So I'm not sure what um, you would give me as advice on how to deal with a situation like that. You know, who, 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 so who, who do you deal with? So they came through a third party? No, no, no. This was an artist that came to me uh, that I met actually on campus directly. Okay. Um, I actually saw her recently and she was kind of shy of wanting to work with me because I think she was a little afraid because she maybe hasn't dealt with someone, you know, like me who's Pro Tools certified and whatnot. But the files, the, did, did she send you the files or she did, did it come from somebody else? No, she sent me the files. Okay. Does she, does she have the ability to open the session in her computer? I, 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 dude, I've had a hard time getting in touch with her, honestly. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, I can only tell you what I do in this position. That's what I'm so asking. So basically, yeah. If I open up a session and it's playing incorrectly or there's a technical error, like say if you had to import audio files and they didn't export them with all the same start time and now you have to guess where they start, I just said, fix it. Right. Send it to me again. You know, and there's, so are they sending it to you in a session format or as a WAVES file? Um, she was sending it to me in WAVES file and then she tried to send it to me in Pro Tools, but all the clips were just ghost clips. When she sent it to me in uh, Pro okay, Tools. so she yes, yeah, she didn't attach the audio files themselves. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, and so so right, so she so if she has her session in Pro Tools, she has to. My recommendation would would be for her to save a session copy in. That's what she's which gonna copies have to do, the session right. and makes a whole new audio file folder right. in a new folder that would and name it. You know, uh, my hit song. What was your name again? Dylan. For, for Dylan. Mm -hmm. My hit song for Dylan. So have you ever dealt with a situation like this with a band? Yep. What do you o deal with in that situation? I, I contact them and go, your session's not opening correctly. Okay. You know, and then I explain to them what I just explained to you. You know, if sometimes you have to walk them through it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it yeah. all depends on what their knowledge is of it. But a lot of, so what I get a lot of times is, missing audio files right you know what i mean and then i'll call them up and I'll go, they'll go oh don't worry you don't need that one <laughs> and, I, and i say to them <laughs> look, the look this is how it works i say to them if the session doesn't open up correctly i have to question the integrity of the entire session absolutely so my recommendation would be to have your artist try it again i think she just sent you the pro tools you know just the the .ptx thing she literally with did. no audio files. She had to re-download Pro Tools. That was the only way she was able to even do this. Got it. I tried to even tell her, look, I think you need to re come and re-record this with me. You know, <laughs> no, no cap, because like... Well, it, but, but she, <laughs> she wants you to mix it, right? Right, but dude, because dude, of how dude, poor so, it was dude, before. Dude, 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 right. like, prove yourself with the mix first. Then well, on the no, next no. song or the next album, she's going to be hooked on you. Well, she was already wanting to talk to me about possibly scheduling something for recording. So at that nice. point, I was like, all right, I probably would rather just do that, you know, because then, you know, I don't even have to worry about whatever you know, garbage I'm going to receive. I'll be able to take care of it all myself. Well, it sounds like you got it. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate it, man. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Appreciate I, I hope advice. I was able to help. You were. Yeah. A little bit of advice. Thank you. Appreciate you. We doing online or we got an online one? Yeah. Sure, go. Yeah. All right. We have Gerard Kenneth asking from Utah. He says, "I wanted to understand how using analog gear with a doll and digital plugin is beneficial in this age of mixing." Okay, so <clears throat> if you're using analog equipment in your DAW, so let's just say you're using an 1176 hardware, and then you're going to use up one uh, digital input and one digital output. That's all 100% fine and dandy. You have to go into your preferences and make sure that the, um, you can adjust the um, delay compensation for that specific input or output. So my thoughts on this are going to be slightly different. I know my thoughts on this are going to be very different than my brother. I'll have to be quite honest with you. Like, so if, for example, they were using 1176, there are so many great 1176 plugins. You know, I have racks of analog equipment I don't use anymore, okay? But I still have them. And occasionally, if, if I'm looking for an exact flavor, I'll go and do it. But I don't see a huge benefit in it, you know what I mean? And again, to get it to work correctly where, there's no, where, there's, where your phase locked will require a significant amount of time and effort 
uh, when it's it just, just as it, it and when you, the yeah. piece of equipment this Changes. was the issue It'll I always change. had yeah. when we were mixing analog is yeah so my assistant wrote down all the settings you know what I mean but a different patch cord or blah 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 or the piece of equipment breaks then you're screwed yeah and so, staying in the creative is probably the biggest thing yeah it's again what I rather than using the analog hardware I would just be focusing more on experimenting with the plugins that you have. So and just to kind of tag on to that, you are summing, though, from Pro Tools to your console. I, I do sum through. I, I, look, my projects come out through a console. Okay, so it's not like two channels on a console going through an SSL. It's here's your bass drum, here's your snare drum. It comes out. I call Pro Tools as a multi-track on steroids. So I'm 99% of my EQing and compression is coming from in the box. Yeah, and I think that's kind of more... I, so I yeah, hope that helps. Yeah. Awesome. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, my name is AJ. I'm a mix engineer from New Jersey as well. Yo, Jersey in the house. Yes, sir. How you doing? Yes, sir. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be having your class next month. Super excited. Um, first of all, thank you for doing everything you do. You have mixed and recorded my favorite records of all time. Um, I was looking forward to this all day. And I decided to listen to uh, We Don't Need to Whisper uh, by Angels and Airwaves again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thousand records later, he's like, what? Yeah, okay. Oops, um, I'm like, <laughs> that record is so ethereal and massive and wide sounding. Um, I just have some questions. What did you, uh, if, you can, if you can remember, um, what did you... Uh, use on the vocal chain and guitar chain for that record. Yeah, so Tom is awesome. Tom DeLong. Tom Great was vocalist. awesome, man. You know, so the, when Angels and Airwaves stuff came in, he had some pretty good rough mixes. So he was doing this pre-delay reverb. So like it was reverb and then more pre-delay reverb. So there was all these reflections bouncing around in the reverbs. I was hearing that in his rough mixes. I just took it and hopefully brought it up to another level. Um, and to be honest, the, the, and it's, again, it's the weirdest thing. I was using on the, the I know on the, um, on the Adventure, I was using an Eventide plugin called, what's the Eventide Reverb plugin? I can't remember it, but there's, it's, it's actually was an Eventide Reverb plugin, and I, I actually created a preset that it's not available to you, but in my s system, it's just, you know, AV, AVA vocals, you know, the, that has all these reflections in it, you know, but a 480L, you know, like a Lexicon 480L mm -hmm. or 480L type plugin would do the same thing. It's, it's again, it's just adding a bunch of reflections to, uh, to, to, to it. And then on the vocal chain, with him, again, it was 1176, BF76 exactly is what I used, the Bomb Factory 1176 plug-in with EQ in front of it. Absolutely amazing, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. There actually is, there, there, there is something online I did, I did do a, we did do something. Like some with, sort of mix with the masters, right? It, well, I can't say what it was, but there was something online using the, well, it'd be disrespectful to, to, to full no, sale. No, it's totally fine. So, yeah, yeah, Leslie, but there, there, everybody's there is mix, something yeah. online ab about me breaking apart, you know, the, the, uh, the adventure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Online. Yes. We have Jabo here. He says, what are some tips and advice to have a better craft in mixing? Hire me. <laughs> oh, wait, where's, where's, uh, hey. what, what's his name? Yeah, he's there. He's online, uh, Javo. Yeah, yeah, Javo, yeah. mixed by Tom Lord LG. <laughs> no, so I think we discussed some of them. So one I think is, is, if you think the drums are too loud, they're too low. So start right there. And when you think the mix is finished, Turn the drums up 2 dB. Uh, for real. Jason, that was Jason. Jason's thing is you can never have too much snare drum. You can never have too much snare. Well, Chris <laughs> and I used to have wars. I won that war, by the way. I won that war because you guys can go and listen to, it's an 80s song. It's at the end of Pretty in Pink, that Molly Ringwall movie. It's a song called If You Leave by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. And Chris and I used to, who could get the loudest snare drum on a hit record? 
okay? And, th and that snare sample, I, I nicked right off of Hall & Oates' Big Bam Boom. So it's a Clear Mountain <laughs> snare sample. Bob's but, watching yeah, too. But, but again, it's, it's have the point of reference, you know, it, just to answer the question, you know, start with a point of reference. You know, remember, it's not the gear, it's your ear. So focus on what's selling the song and, and what the hooks are in the song and disregard anything that's taking up space or minimize it. Awesome. So good luck. All right, um, my name is Juan. Um, I'm a session guitar player and I produce. Um, so one of my favorite records and one of the greatest records of all time, which is Supernatural by Santana, um, you mix that record, so I want, and you know, like you, you. So I just want to clarify. Uh -huh. So I mixed. Ever, I mixed the Everlast song. Mm -hmm. I want to say I can't, I can't remember if I mixed another one. I mixed the one Everlast song on that record. I might have mixed another one, but I can't remember. But go oh, continue. Yeah. So like, um, I want to ask you because like, what? Um, oh crap! I forgot my question. So, um, to you, what separates? a good record from an amazing, excellent record? So uh, I, I didn't catch the first part of the question. It was mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the... So for you, what makes like the separation between a good record and an amazing, excellent record? Uh, a couple of zeros. In other words, in sales. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, the difference between a good record and an excellent record? That's a really good question, Juan. <laughs> Thank you. I think the difference between a good record and an excellent record is a, a great example of a good record would be mixed by Chris Lord Algae. And a great ex yeah, you all know where I'm going. <laughs> Hello, bro. It's You know Chris so Lord wants to I come back. Tell you, I mean, you know, so he's never coming back now. <laughs> so it's all, it's all it, you know, as engineers, as, as a mixing engineer, I can't do it with blank tape. So the difference between good and great is the performances that you're given and how, how do you manipulate them. You know, I'm not pulling the shit out of thin air, like the Blink-182 song that you played. You know, that song, the only thing that I heard from the, from the, first, from the intro to the first course, I hear my intro. I'm an intro-outro guy, so I created that weird, spacey, little noisy intro. You know, it's a H3000 something. But the song itself, it's just a great damn song. You know, so I just tried to, to, to embellish it um, and, and make it better. But there's one thing you got to remember. You, no matter what, and uh, no matter what, you can't fuck up a good song. You cannot fuck up a good song. A good song is always going to be a good song, whether it's mixed by me or mixed by you or mixed by anybody, because it's the song. You know what I mean, that's that's why we're all here. We're just here. We're here for the music. You know. So thank you for the question, Juan. All right. Thank you so much for sharing all your amazing, amazing experience and work. Thanks, man. All right. Appreciate it. Yep. Online. We have Kamoy here. He asked, "Do you have any tips and techniques for setting up and capturing smooth, clear vocal recordings?" Yeah, start with a microphone, a good microphone. You know, I would run it through, again, a good mic pre, you know what I mean? And then be in, in, a, in a place where you have can control, you know, the environment. But to, if you want to get the best performance, make sure that the, the vibe of the room and what the artist is hearing is, in, is, is best for them. You know, has to be a good vibe, but to be honest, I can get a great vocal sound. What kind of microphone is this? Yes, I can get a great vocal sound with this microphone. You know, I mean, I've done it with singers with just, you know, an SM57. Yeah. You know, it, well, it, so, yeah, and some singers, they're, they're such live singers that they want to record with just a handheld or a 58 or whatever. Yeah, what's like Maynard does a 58, I think, doesn't he? Tool or something, I think I've heard he's... Steve Winwood used to use a, a, an RE20. You know, but, but the main thing is just get a good clean path you know what I mean? But most importantly, to get a good performance, you need to, you need to have the artist comfortable. So I hope that helps. Cool. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Willie. I'm a music and mixing. What's up, and Willie? It's weird. With the mask on, you look a little bit like Neil Avron. <laughs> oh, my gosh, he did. That. Thank you. <laughs> he does, right? Yeah. He's taller, though. <laughs> 
We're gonna get so much trouble. No, How are you doing, Willie? I'm doing good, good. I'm a music producer and mixing engineer from the Bahamas. And first of all, I want to say it's an honor to talk to you, sir. I uh, watch so much of your stuff online. But the question I wanted to ask was, I'm working with a mixing engineer abroad, and I'm sending him the stems from the stuff that I'm creating. What are your key advices for sending good stems and uh, making sure that his mixing is you know, going well without any interferences? I would recommend sending him, again, for me to, to get the best mix out. I, I can't say because I don't know how he mixes and, and what, uh, what, what he uses, but I can just tell you that for me, you know, that I at least want the stems or what the, the, the audio files you're sending me to resemble the song. So in other words, you know, I don't want you to commit your drum equalization, your drum gating, or any of that. I would rather have the raw drums, but as far as the other instruments, you know, I'm open to having that sent in, in a committed form. You, you know what I mean? That would be helpful. That saves a lot of time and then allows me to manipulate it even further. You know what I mean? So again, if he's working with the same DAW program that you're working with, my recommendation would be just send him the, the, the very last rough mix session that you have. You know, make a copy of it, clean out all the extraneous shit that's in there that we don't need, mixes we don't need alternate playlists, we don't need stuff that you already know that you're not gonna use, and we don't need plugins that are in there and deactivated. So you just kind of do a quick cleanup on it and send him that. You know, I, I would think if he's using the same DAW, he would be happy with that. And, and he would deliver great mixes from that. Oh, if we're sending wave files, should we be sending the, the stems at unity gain or should we bring it down like negative 6 dB to leave some headroom for the sounds or what would you recommend? No, so I mean, the, 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 the mixer can, you know, basically, so if you're sending stems out as wave files like, like you're doing, you need to be, you need to be conscious that you may have to send them out again. So by manipula or by changing the gain of them the first time you do it, you may forget it. So he may go, you know what? There's a there's a an, an error in the second verse vocal. Can you just send me the second verse vocal again? And all of a sudden you'll send it to him. It would be 6 dB louder. I mean, like, I can figure that one out. But basically, leave them at the, whatever level they're at. Like, again, we we as mixers, of, of course, we're going to have to deal with the headroom issue. You know, you you know. Let the mixer do his job. Right. Thank you so much. So good luck to cool. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we get one more quick question? And it's got to be semi-quick because we got to wrap up. I'm not sure if they got something else going on in here, but yeah, we got to wrap up. So. Uh, I'll take a little, uh, My name is Jorge. I'm in Recording Arts. And I wanted to ask, what are some struggles you still have today or challenges that you still had back in the day? Oh, jeez. <laughs> that was oh, not a quick question. No, no, no. That's, <laughs> well, the struggles I'm having today. Or, or maybe just like the main one. Well, it's... Um, I struggle disappointing my clients. I struggle with that. And, and it's very difficult. But I, I, I feel that it's, it's a natural thing. When I'm mixing, I go through, it's not unusual for me to go through the whole range of emotions from the first time you hear the song where you're excited to when the first time you hear their drum set and you're like, oh my God. You know, and you, and that you know you're just in for a world of hurt and a lot of work to when you got the drum sound up and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that I just made chicken salad out of chicken shit. Then you go to the bass guitar, and there's more bad news. You know, so the whole th thing of mixing is like this whole swing of emotions. But the great news is when you get to the end of the mix, it's like, I am the man, because you've, you've, you've per persevered, and you've gone through it all. So, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is disappointing my, my, my clients and, my, and the artists, because, again, that like they... They've put their faith in me, you know what I mean? So, and the last thing I want to do is disappoint them. I, I want to meet their expectations. I want to go beyond their expectations. I want them to say to me, I was, uh, it's better than I even imagined. Then I know I, I did a good job. 
Cool. Unfortunately, we've got to wrap up. Um, real quickly, I want to thank SSL for helping us make this happen with Tom, Fady, and hey. Phil, and Don, and everybody. And man, let's just give it to Tom. He's amazing talent. Thank you.